as an incorporated public university, ITS has been able to manage autonomously the policy of academics, organizations, finance, students' affairs, human resources, facilities, operational, and infrastructure. In the spirit of Indonesian heroes, during the battle in the 10th of November 1945, ITS always makes efforts to be the best in education, research, and community services, especially in the fields of industry and maritime. ITS also actively contributes to the nation development, and in the future, ITS will become an entrepreneurial university with world-class reputation. ITS has many achievements, both national and international achievements prove that ITS keeps growing and gives the best contribution to the nation of Indonesia. ITS is a place for new hopes to grow, an ideal environment for the new generation to flourish in three strategic locations within the industrial city of Surabaya. As a smart eco-campus, ITS maintains harmony between technological advances and the sustainability of the surrounding ecosystem. ITS has seven faculties with prospective scientific fields, including Scientics, INSIS, Vocation, Creatives, MarTech, Electics. Safe plan. ITS is a space for the new generation who are hungry for knowledge because it provides a wide range of references in both physical and digital form. ITS makes it easier for the new generation to access information by providing flexible classes. ITS keeps moving forward in facing future challenges by providing the best facilities for the new generation's activities. The facilities support both spiritual and physical needs. ITS also provides research facilities in the ITS Science Techno Park, including ICT and Robotics, Automotive, Maritime, and Creative Industries. Therefore, the excellent generations from ITS will emerge and make history. ITS is a space for the new generation to express themselves. ITS is a place where the new generation learns new things and finds their purpose. ITS has become a place where the new generations that carry the future will be born. ITS is a campus of science and technology which focuses on the research and innovation presenting technology for prosperity. With a spirit of heroism, ITS brings the future before us.
ITS The University of Heroes Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, commence the program, and here are the following webinar protocol. For each participant ID, please use your real name following with your origin of institution. All of participants are expected to mute the audio and only unmute the video during the event. We cordially invite you to take your own firm and comfort seat in your own room and please avoid the backlight. Make sure that you have a good and stable internet connection. If you have an earphone or headset, we recommend you to use it so that your voice can clearly and loudly to be heard. During the Q&A discussion session, all participants, please use the chat box to deliver the questions. Thank you for your cooperation and consideration. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the guest lecture series on SDGs today on Wednesday, 23 June 2021. I am Intan from ITS Global Engagement and I will be your master of ceremony this afternoon. Thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs today. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you of some rules for the event. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format name underscore campus. Second, during the lecture, please turn off your microphone and only turn it on when the moderator gives the change. Third, please turn on your camera. Fourth, please adjust the seat position comfortably and prevent the backlight effect. Fifth, ensure your network has a stable internet connection. Sixth, please, please fill your attendance at bit.ly slash attendance underscore GLS SDGs. And our committee also send the attendance link in the Zoom chat box. For participants who wish to get an A certificate and stamp, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the session starts. Seventh, participants who wish to ask questions during the question and answer session, Please send your question to intip.in slash QA GLS SDGs and the link for the questions also listed in the, in the Zoom chat box. Or you can ask directly by clicking the raise hand feature. Ladies and gentlemen, this guest lecture series on SDGs is dedicated as a form of appreciation in commemorating the 16th, 16th anniversary of the Institute of Technology 10 November Surabaya. And today's topic is climate change, life below water, that will be delivered by our speaker, Dr. Abd Abdul Rahman Abdul Rahim from UTM Malaysia. And this lecture will be moderated by Mr. Aditya Danu from ITS. Before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follow. First, opening. Second, introduction to moderator and speaker. Third, lecture session. Fourth, Q&A session. Fifth, certificate awarding and sixth closing. Now, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce our moderator. So hereby, we have Mr. Raditya Danurianto from ITS, and he is currently, um, for the professional experience, he is a lecturer at the Department of Ocean Engineering at ITS, and for the educational background, he is a master degree 
his uh, bachelor degree in ocean engineering at ITS, and then the master degree in offshore engineering at ITS Surabaya, and also the PhD for now in Northeastern University Boston in a civil engineering with Fulbright scholarship awardee. So without any further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda. Mr. Raditya Danu, the time is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Abila as uh, MC. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I will start uh, the, the uh, today's webinar by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Subhanallahumma wa bihamdika. Asyhadu alla ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Rabbi sidni ilman wa razuqni fahman. Allahumma rahmatna bil Quran wa sadaqallahu aladzim. Ya Allah, increase me, increase us in knowledge and give us a complete understanding for this uh, today's webinar. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for all the attendance, for finding time and visiting today's webinar. My name is uh, Rabbi Tirinurianto. You can call me Danu. And I am a junior lecturer at the uh, Department of Ocean Engineering, uh, ITS Surabaya, and I will be your moderator today. So in today's webinar, we will have uh, our honorable presenter, Professor Dr. Abdul Rahman bin Abdul Rahim from University Technology Malaysia. Uh, today, he will uh, bring the topic of climate change with special attention to life below water. So uh, Professor Rahman has a BSc in Mechanical Engineering and Engineering Management at University of Evansville, USA and MSc in Manufacturing System Engineering at University of Warwick, and uh, has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering at UPM. So uh, uh, he is now a uh, uh, Associate Director, uh, uh, Associate Lecturer Graduate School of Business Administration, Meiji University Tokyo, and also Associate Director at UTM International Kuala Lumpur. And he has a lot of uh, research experience, on uh, uh, air sustainable supplier selection and uh, turbo machinery uh, system. So uh, I will uh, give you uh, the the uh, uh, sorry. I will I will give you the uh, speakers uh, uh, CV in the uh, screen, and we will have the webinar from three thirty up to five thirty with. 60 minutes presentation from Professor Rahman. And after that, uh, we have a very flexible time for QA. And we also invite you uh, uh, to give us comments and questions. And please look at the QA link in the chat box on your screen. If you think uh, you want to ask uh, the question in Bahasa, uh, it is okay. And now uh, we will let uh, Professor Rahman start the presentation. Professor Rahman. The time and the stage is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Danu. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for organizing this uh, particular sharing session. I'm not an expert in sustainable development, but uh, what I have is that, uh, something that I could share with you that would probably uh, benefit uh, each and every one of us. So the title given to me is, uh, or rather the title that I have chosen is uh, SDG goal uh, 14, which is life below water. Okay. So, you know, the, the United Nations, they have come up with this uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and there are 17 uh, SDG. So, my topic here is on SDG 14, which is life below water. Uh, again, uh, as the tagline here mentions, healthy oceans sustain life and promote prosperity. And we will see how and why the ocean is extremely important, uh, not just for the uh, sea creatures or the uh, uh, creatures underwater, but also for us as a human being as well. So I purposely choose this map of Indonesia because Indonesia is unique in which it has uh, thousands of islands and is surrounded by uh, sea. And 
uh, one of the country that has the most biodiversity in the world in terms of the ocean is actually. Uh, Professor Raman, sorry, uh, I I I I would interrupt you. Uh, I think you forgot to share the uh, screen. I didn't. Or... Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't share the screen. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, let me see this. Okay. My apologies. Okay, my apologies. I hope you can see the screen now. Can you? Yep. 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 Ah, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, where is it? Okay. So this. Um, okay. This is the first slide. Yeah. The sustainable development goals. Goals, and there are uh, 17 goals, and life below water is the SDG number 14. <laughs> And as I mentioned just now, uh, the ocean is extremely important uh, to sustain life, not just for the uh, creature below the sea or below water, but for us human beings as well. And Indonesia being surrounded by the sea, uh, it is much more at stake as perhaps compared to other countries. Uh, not just Indonesia, I think Malaysia, the Philippines, you know, uh, the country is basically surrounded by sea. And uh, Raja Ampat, as you know, is one of the best diving sites in the world. And it has one of the highest biodiversity in the world. And the other one is that almost 50% of the sea creatures, they live uh, very close to the coastal area. And only 10% of the sea creatures that live actually way, way below underwater or more than 200 meters. Uh, this is the picture of Raja Ampat, uh, one of the best diving sites in the world. Uh, I haven't been here yet. And Indonesia, apart from Raja Ampat, there is another one called Pulau Sabang, if I'm not mistaken, north of Sumatra, which has also one of the best diving sites in the region. And again, why it, di it attracts divers to come to this places to dive and spend money. It is because of the beauty of the coral, the fish, and uh, other sea creatures below the water. Uh, this is actually, uh, by the way, the, the pictures are not all mine. I just took this from the internet. Yeah, so I can't claim uh, any copyright on this. But again, uh, it is available in the public domain. So I, I don't think there is a big issue with regards to copyright. But anyway, uh, this is the picture taken uh, in the, one of the uh, islands in Raja Ampat. So as what you can see here, you can see it's very, very beautiful. Um, you can see the corals and, and other things uh, below the water. And this attract a lot of sea creatures to come breed and stay in, in this area. So as what you can see, uh, this is again my pictures taken by some of the divers in Raja Ampat area. So even the corals, it has uh, different colors. Uh, you can see the fish, different type, all kinds of fish living around this area. So if there is no coral, there is no fish. If there is no fish, there is no fisherman. If there is no fisherman, there is no fish on the table for us to eat. So again, this is why it is extremely important to make sure that whatever underwater remain as it is. But because of human action, things are changing now uh, due to global warming, the, uh, the, the dumping of plastics in the ocean, the microplastics that get into the, uh, the, the uh, fish and other creatures. And all, all of these have a negative impact in the long term for us human. Okay, uh, this is my picture. I'm a diver, a mature diver. Um, and again, uh, diving is, is, again, why people go diving is basically to see whatever is uh, underwater. And just to share with you, um, most divers, I'm not a professional diver. I'm a, they call it fun dive, yeah? But anyway, uh, so this, this, the suit that I'm wearing, this is called a wetsuit. The thickness is three millimeter. And why we need to wear wetsuit when we dive? Because the water at 10 or 15 meters is actually quite cold. So if you want to dive for like 45 minutes or one hour, so you have to have enough heat uh, to, to, to maintain your metabolism and et cetera. Uh, meaning to say that even one degree increase in the seawater, it can affect the whole marine life. 
So that is why global warming is something that we should really um, seriously uh, take into account whenever whatever things in whatever things that we do because it will dramatically affect the life below the sea. Uh, by the way, this is in Sabah, uh, one of the states in Malaysia, uh, at one of the island called Mabul Island. There is another island called Sipadan, which is also one of the best diving sites in the world. And this is uh, the diving sites close to Mabul Island, it's called Kapalai. So you can see the water here is very clear, it's very nice, it's clean, because this island is, is like 40 minutes boat rides from the shore. And this is a protected island by law. That means people can't go close to the island to fish and do other things. So that is why the, the whole island itself is in this pristine condition. And the ocean life, we can split into three zones. The first one is called the sunlit zone. The second one is the twilight zone. And the last one is the midnight zone. So again, as I said, almost 90% of all the sea creatures, they live within the sunlit zone, which is, which is between uh, up to 200 meters or 650 feet. Uh, below that, 200 to uh, 1,000 meters, there are other creatures such as uh, sperm whales, uh, Japanese spider crabs, but emperor penguin, they don't live underneath the sea, but they can dive and swim. Uh, up to 200 meters to eat the squid and jellyfish and uh, other sea creatures at this depth. And in the midnight zone, there are other sea creatures as well, but here there is no sunlight at all. So the sea creature like this fish, it has to create its, its own light. And most of this animal, uh, not most, some of these animals, they are totally blind because there is no light at all. So when, when we, are, we are talking about the uh, life below sea, um, uh, it applies mostly to the sunlit zone. Okay, um, same thing. So these are the target of uh, SDG 14, life below water, there are seven uh, targets. I will go through briefly each one of this. So these are the uh, 14 targets. Target number one, by 2025, uh, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds. Yeah. So these are the actions that the government, the uh, NGOs, and perhaps even us that we can take, you know, to reduce uh, marine pollution. So what are the, the, the source of, of uh, marine pollution? Yeah, it could be from uh, land base, such as oil, uh, dirt, uh, waste from septic tanks, uh, runoff from farms, motor vehicles, uh, trash. So these are the things that flow to the sea and it has a negative effect to the sea creatures. Uh, for instance, in the uh, urban areas, so most of the big cities, uh, not just in Indonesia, but, but in other parts of the world as well, is located close to the sea. So whenever it rains, the runoff from the roads, from the city center will go into the drain and it will uh, flow straight into the sea. So this is the, the uh, runoff from, from the uh, urban areas. So just imagine big cities like Jakarta, Yogyakarta, Surabaya, um, and the other one is Bandung. So these are all the cities which are very close to, to the sea. And given the higher, high, very high number of populations, so the effect is, is much more significant as compared to uh, smaller cities. So that is again one of the reasons why uh, worldwide, uh, many governments are actually promoting the use of public transport so that there will, be, there will be less vehicles on the road. You know, when a car is traveling on the road, the tire is rubber and the tire is worn, worn out. Yeah. 
and it is accumulated on, on the road. So when it rains, that very small particles, it flow together with the rainwater into the sea. So the more vehicles there are on the roads, the more polluted the sea will become, not to mention the emission that is coming from the exhaust pipe. Um, so in terms of uh, pollution, yeah, they are abiotic, which is non-living things, and there is also a biotic uh, pollution. Uh, abiotic, for instance, uh, air, pollu uh, air pollutants, mechanical stress, pesticides, radiation. Uh, in Malaysia, we have some problem with pesticide as well because uh, most of the big plantations, they use pesticides to kill off the um, uh, pests, basically. Um, and when it rains, the, the spray, when they spray the pesticide, not, it is a wash off and became a water runoff, goes into the river and it, it goes into the sea because Malaysia is the second largest palm oil producer in the world. Uh, Indonesia is the highest or the largest palm oil producer in the world. So I think the, the problem of water runoff from uh, palm oil plantation is, is more serious in Indonesia as compared to Malaysia. But nonetheless, it is a, a, a common issue now. And in some area in Malaysia, strangely, when it rains, the water treatment plant has to be stopped whenever it rains. So it confused the people. Why when it rains, there is no water in the uh, pipe? The reason being is that the runoff from the palm oil plantation, it goes into the river and the water intake for the water treatment plant is perhaps downstream. And uh, when they, uh, the water treatment plant, they do the test, they found perhaps maybe the level of pesticide is why, then they have to stop operations for like 12, or 24 hours and people complain a lot because of that people because uh, of this water runoff you know. so it is strange because when it rains there's no water uh, this is partly because of the runoff from pesticides uh, not all states especially in Johor yeah one one of the states right um, so below water pollution uh, air pollution, water pollution, soil, noise, uh, thermal pollution, uh, plastics, and radioactive pollution. So these these are the seven uh, pollutions you know that affect uh, life below water. Uh, noise can be a pollution as well because when a boat is passing through some areas, it will scare the fish away. And if the vibration from the engine is too much, perhaps it can damage the coral. So it is also a form of pollution. So the source of water pollution, it comes from uh, municipal waterways, industrial waste, inorganic pollutants, uh, agricultural waste, marine pollution, as well as thermal pollution. Um, again, if you notice, most of the big power plants are located by the sea and to cool off the turbine, seawater is being pumped you know, to cool off the turbine and that warm water from the cooling process is released back into the sea. So uh, this will increase the temperature of uh, the seawater around the uh, power plant. Yeah, so this is one, one example of thermal pollution. So it will affect the marine life as well because the water is, is warm. And as we know, the seawater is a bit cool. Acid rain. So the, the emission from power plants, it will release uh, sulfur dioxide as well as nitrogen dioxide. So this uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide is emitted as smoke. It goes all the way up. It's mixed with the cloud. And when it rains, uh, the uh, nitrogen dioxide will become nitric acid and sulfur dioxide will become sulfuric acid. So this will cause the C to be acidified. That means the pH uh, will be less than 7. And this will also affect the life below sea because the pH 
uh, for seawater is it is slightly uh, alkaline, slightly more than seven. So when it become acidic, of course, it will affect the corals and other creatures below the sea. Right. Uh, these are some of the other uh, source of pollution. You know? So from the power plant uh, runoff from the land sources, accidental spills, um, aircraft that is flying above the sea or above the ocean, the, the emission that comes from the jet engine, you know, some of the particles will settle onto the surface of the sea. Uh, oil and gas extraction of petroleum, which contribute to 2.9% and natural oil seepage. Yeah? So all of this contribute to the pollution, water pollution. Uh, this is one of the latest uh, event, of course, Sri Lanka. So this ship is from China, it's bound to Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. It carried a quite a significant number of chemicals. Uh, the ship was burned down, and I think in a couple of days, it actually sank. So a ship this big, it carried fuel, maybe like 200 to 300 ton of marine fuel. So this marine fuel, again, will pollute the whole area. And what makes this case even worse, because the ship is carrying chemicals, so it has some acids and some other industrial chemicals, which is spilled over onto the sea. Uh, the ship is, I think, owned by one of the company from Singapore. Yeah, Singapore registered MVX Press Pearl, carrying uh, almost 1,500 containers, uh, 25 tons of nitric acid, uh, along with other chemicals and cosmetics. And uh, a fire erupted on board after an explosion on May 20 this year. Uh, this is, okay, the, yeah, this is the, the one. Yeah? Uh, this is the ship that is burned under fire. Uh, there is another one um, in August last year, 2020. Uh, this is a Japanese tanker which ran aground off coast uh, Mauritius. And there's a significant amount of oil spill as well. And unfortunately, the ship is broken into two. And you can imagine the amount of oil that is being spilled onto the sea. And uh, it affects a lot of marine life. Uh, deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the, the, the pollution it covered over 110,000 square kilometers of the ocean surface and reached over 2,000 kilometers of shoreline. Yeah. So this is the effect of the uh, BP oil field, oil spill, the deep water horizon. A platform caught fire. Uh, here we can see that there is fire uh, above the uh, surface of the water. And of course, they will, this will cause a certain amount of uh, pollution to the surrounding area. Okay. Uh, the thing about pollution is that uh, because, oops, sorry. Um, on, on the smallest level, yeah, the, uh, the baby fish. So the picture on the left-hand side, this is for, for normal uh, baby fish. And this is one, uh, the one on the right, uh, this is where the oil pollution occur. So we can see the difference. Uh, this one, the normal one should be straight, but this one is a bit curved. Um, so this is for Pacific herring. And we can see the, the difference yeah, at the eye area. Uh, this is a pink salmon. It's a normal one. This is the one that is exposed to pollution. And uh, this is another one was called a zebra fish. OK, what happened is that during fertilization of the egg, if there is even a small amount of pollution, you know, uh, during the fertilization process, it will affect or it will cause some genetic damage to the egg. Hence, the fish that, that is uh, produced, or rather the baby fish, it becomes defective. I mean, it has some physical defects. So this is for fish. 
the concern is that if a human is exposed to the same uh, chemicals, will it cause uh, physical defects if a baby is born? So this is this is still very much uh, under research. And for certain chemicals, there is a very strong linkage between birth defects and the exposure of uh, the the mother during pregnancy to uh, certain chemicals. Um, whales. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, this is the uh, the case of Exxon Valdez uh, in North America, quite a number of years back, uh, one of the largest oil spill in the world, in Canada. Yeah, that was in Canada. A threat to coral reef and land-based sources of uh, from the land-based sources of pollution. Uh, again, the uh, coral reef is uh, very sensitive to temperature, to uh, certain chemicals, and coral reef depends a lot on uh, other sea creatures in order for it to survive. Yeah, The color on the coral reef is actually due to an algae that is grown uh, surrounding the coral. So different algae will give a different color. A slight increase in temperature will cause the algae to die to move to other places. Once the algae is not there, the coral is exposed. So once the coral is exposed, there is no protection anymore, then the coral is dead. So that is why in some area you can see uh, dead corals everywhere. And again, if there is no coral, there is no fish. So it is highly interlinked uh, between one aspect to another. Now, that is always a cause and effect. And the other one is uh, what is known as a garbage patch. So whatever things that is thrown into the ocean, it does not end there, but it ends up in other countries. Uh, this is a map of a garbage patch. And it is just circulating in this area because we can see the, the current. Yeah, the current is, is moving, but it's moving in uh, certain patterns. So hence the garbage, the so-called garbage of the sea, it is just floating there. It's not going anywhere. Uh, maybe a certain amount will be coming to the shore, but most of it will remain in the oceans. Uh, based on one statistics, uh, 8 million tons of plastic are dumped into the oceans every year. So of this uh, 8 million metric tons of plastics, um, again, based on some mathematical interpolation, uh, these are the number of uh, pollutants. For instance, uh, food wrappers and containers, more than 1 million pieces. Uh, these are the top three items found in the, in the ocean. And then the plastic beverage bottles, more than 1 million bottles as well, and plastic bag. So that is why in some countries, the use of a single-use plastic bag is actually banned uh, because people just use it for once and people throw it away. And in fact, most of our plastic that we use are called single-use plastic, the one that is used for packaging. Uh, I think now, uh, because of the pandemic, most people are buying things through uh, e-commerce platform. And you can see multiple wraps, even for uh, one single product. And what, did, what do we do with the wraps? We just throw it away. Yeah, so some of it perhaps will end up in the ocean. Right, and the other one is uh, apart from the normal plastics, you know, the other plastic debris in the ocean are fishing nets. So fishing nets actually kill more sea creatures as compared to plastics. In fact, this is probably uh, one of the highest uh, cost of um, death among uh, sea creatures because of this, uh, what they call a ghost net. So sometimes the fishermen, when, they, when there is uh, some defects with the fish net, they just throw into the ocean. And what it becomes, it becomes a trap, a death trap for sea creatures like these uh, particular turtles. And as we know, the plastic material, it will take hundreds of years to decompose. Uh, even uh, uh, disposable diapers will take 450 years. A cigarette butt, one to five years, yeah, and uh, plastic bottle, 450 years, fishing line, 600 years. So that is why it will be there for hundreds of and hundreds of years. 
Okay, these are the 12 major sources of plastic pollution. Uh, plastic bottle, the cap, uh, polystyrene, polystyrene uh, single-use fork, straw. Uh, in Malaysia, there are certain states that actually ban the use of uh, single-use straw. Uh, so some, some restaurant, they use a, uh, what do you call this? A paper straw. And people are also encouraged to bring their own straw, which is normally like a, a metal tube. Yeah, so again, this is to to prevent or to reduce the, the use of a straw. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is again based on a study. How much single-use plastics huh. uh, do countries generate yeah? per person? So in Australia, one person generate 59 kilogram of plastics in the United States, 53%. And again, we can see that uh, most of the developed countries, uh, the, the use of plastic is much more as compared to developing countries. So we can see uh, South Korea, United Kingdom, uh, Japan, uh, the number of kilograms per person is, is quite high. But again, now there are efforts to reduce the use of uh, single-use plastics. And when I was a student in the United Kingdom way back in 1991, when I was doing my, my master's degree, I still remember if we go to the uh, supermarket, uh, either Tesco or Sainsbury back then, if we didn't bring our own plastic bag, then we will charge five pence. Yeah, five pence per plastic bag. And five pen is a lot of money uh, back then in 1991. So this is to discourage uh, people to use uh, single-use plastic. Uh, this is again a very sad picture to see, uh, a picture of seahorse clinging into these cotton buds, which is not natural at all. Yeah, And a seahorse is an extremely, extremely a sensitive creature to even a small change uh, of the, uh, what you call this, the parameter of, of the, of the sea, sea water. But yet, it is clinging to this cotton bud. Yeah? Uh, again, a very sad picture of these turtles eating plastic straw. And turtles, would normally eat jellyfish, yeah? So underwater, a plastic bag looks exactly like jellyfish. So some of the turtle, perhaps they don't, they can't distinguish between the jellyfish and the plastic bags. So some of them ended up eating the plastic bags and it will cause uh, some problems to the digestive system. And sometimes uh, the turtle just die because of that. Uh, this is uh, called puffer fish, which is very popular in Japan. Uh, again, this fish, when, when it is angry, the, the body will just uh, you know, become like a balloon. And uh, in this particular case, it got stuck to the plastic bag. Yeah? And most definitely, if no one saves this uh, particular puffer fish, it will die. Uh, again, another sad example. Uh, this is a uh, seabirds, so uh, that is already dead, and we can see a lot of things inside the stomach of this seabird. Even a cigarette lighter, yeah, um, bottle caps, and and other things. Right. So this is again based on a study. 46% 40, of all plastics in the oceans are fishing nets. And this is the one that is killing the sea creatures. In fact, uh, based on one research, it is killing more sea creatures as compared to plastics. Yeah, but people are not giving a lot of attention to these sea nets or fish net rather. So this is uh, the ghost nets, uh, the one that sink onto the uh, ocean floor and uh, in this particular case, this unlucky shark got trapped into this uh, net. And uh, again, as I said, if no one saved this shark, it will just die from drowning. 
uh, seal uh, are also affected by this uh, CNET. Yeah? Right. So the ghost net, so these are some of the uh, statistics. Uh, over 640,000 tons of fishing gear is lost or discarded into the ocean and it is growing every year. Uh, over 150,000 whales and seals are killed by ghost nets every year globally. And this is quite scary, yeah, given the, the very high number of uh, whales and, and seals which are killed by, by this ghost net. Um, so this is a, it is something like an, an ending cycles. So the fishermen, when they cannot use the net, they will just throw the net into the sea. And this ghost net will trap uh, sharks, whales, and other sea creatures. And it will go all the way down. Okay, because the, like shark just now. Okay, so this, this net is actually floating. And the shark got trapped into in the net, and because of the, the the body weight of the shark, it goes down to the bottom of the sea. Yeah, what is this? Okay, and this uh, other sea creatures will eat the the carcass of the shark. Okay, so once the 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 all the carcass is gone, so the net will float again. And there will be another creature which will be stuck into or caught into the net. And this is an ending cycle. So if there is no one or there is uh, the net is, is, is not being clean from, from the sea. So one can imagine the cycle is unending. So there'll be more and more and more creatures which will be caught in the net. So there are some organizations uh, in the world now that are actually uh, uh, trying to uh, clean up the, the bottom of the sea uh, from this coast net. Uh, most of the works are done by uh, volunteer divers. So the second, S, uh, uh, the second one under SDG 14, uh, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystem. Okay. Uh, this is the marine ecosystems. Uh, we have all kind of fish, we have uh, crabs, um, we have squid, we have zooplankton, we have fish and whatnot. Uh, we have mangrove yeah, that is grown along the, the uh, coast. And mangrove is actually very important for as a breeding ground for the fish, for the crabs, etc. Uh, mangrove gives some kind of protection to to the fish when it wants to, to breed. And mangrove also has other benefits. Number one, as a coastal protection to prevent from erosion. The second one as a water filtration. Yeah, so all the toxic that is flowing uh, underwater will be filtered by the roots of the mangrove. Uh, and uh, fishery, there, there are more and more fish species found in the mangrove uh, ecosystems as compared to places which has no mangrove. So these are the, the benefits of, of having mangrove, uh, man, uh, mangrove forests. And then in terms of climate regulation, because uh, mangrove is able uh, to store more CO2, uh, more carbon in, in the soil as compared to other plants. So there, there are a lot of, of uh, environmental man benefit to the mangrove, plus some economic benefit as well. Uh, for instance, ecotourism. Uh, I think there are quite a number of countries now, even in Malaysia, we have few areas uh, where tourists can actually go deep inside the uh, uh, mangrove forest and they can see nature, they can see uh, some animals, uh, and things like that. So it, it gives some, some kind of economic benefits to the local people. Okay. And uh, in terms of deforestation of the mangrove, uh, in some country, they have what they call this uh, commercial shrimp farm. So most of the commercial 
shrimp farm is actually sitting on previously it was a mangrove forest so the the mangrove tree was cleared and it became a shrimp farm for instance here in honduras uh, this picture was taken in 1987 you just see greens and in 1999 you can see a lot of pink uh, this is due to the deforestation of the mangrove trees and these are the shrimp farms yeah so meaning to say that if you clear the area of mangrove trees there'll be less fish there'll be less bird uh, and there, if there is no place for the fish to breed then again there'll be less fish in the ocean as well so these are some of the drivers of uh, mangrove uh, losses uh, number one is logging so in some places the uh, the wood from the mangrove tree is used for some commercial purposes uh, agriculture for instance in myanmar 88% uh, of mang uh, 88% mangrove loss is due to conversion to rice paddies, uh, aquaculture uh, in some countries, uh, especially uh, shrimp farm. And okay. Uh, the other one is bycatch. Yeah, bycatch also affects sea creatures uh, because bycatch is. Uh, like turtle for instance yeah uh, not people in the world eat turtles but somehow rather the turtle got stuck in the fish net because the turtle is actually feeding nearby and suddenly there is a trawler and it catch the fish along with the turtle so this is called bycatch yeah uh, this is the uh, picture of a turtle. this is quite a big turtle maybe by age 20 30 years old turtle yeah uh, it is not intended to be caught but somehow or other it was caught and unfortunately the turtle died. So this is called the bycatch. Uh, every year fishing bycatch kills 250,000 plus loggerhead and leatherback turtles, 100 plus million sharks, 300,000 small whales and dolphin. So this is the effect of bycatch. Uh, in other words, bycatch and ghost net kill more sea creatures as compared to plastic pollution yeah but most people didn't realize this we thought that plastic is the only source of sea pollution that are killing the sea creatures but the percentage is lower as compared to bycatch or the ghost net uh, stop killing 30 kids to catch one adult uh, this is what happened most of the time. So sometimes to catch one big fish by using this uh, fishing net, it catch another 30 smaller fish. Uh, coral bleaching. Um, so I mentioned that healthy coral has uh, algae. So coral and algae depend on, on each other to survive. And if under stress, the algae leave the coral. And the coral which has no algae on it is left to bleach and becomes vulnerable. So this is, the, this is a healthy coral. When we see colorful coral, it means that it is a very healthy coral. It has a lot of algae, different algae, different color. Even though the coral is the same, but the color is different due to the, the different species of the algae. Due to stress perhaps due to uh, increase in water temperature the algae will just move away and it leave the coral by itself with without any protection so after sometimes the coral is bleached because it has no protection and it become a dead coral okay in the united kingdom they have a 25 year environmental plan to reduce the use of uh, plastics uh, to prevent overfishing, to protect marine ecosystem, uh, etc. 14.3, um, SDG 14.3, minimize and address the impact of ocean acidification, uh, including enhanced scientific cooperation at all levels. Okay, uh, this is the coral triangle. Uh, this slide actually came from WWF. So it covers Malaysia, 
Philippines, and Indonesia. So the color triangle, yeah, so this is called the, the color triangle. It has the, it, it is actually the world's center of marine biodiversity. And I think by, by sea area, Indonesia probably has the highest one yeah, in terms of biodiversity. Right. So how climate change became a threat to the ocean? Um, carbon dioxide, yeah, more than 90% will cause the ocean to become warmer. And 25% of the CO2 will cause the ocean to become more acidic. If there is more acid, then there is less oxygen. So this will definitely affect the life of the sea creatures uh, below water. Okay, how the ocean acidification uh, happen or how it works? Uh, the ocean will absorb CO2 and we know that CO2 comes from uh, passenger aircraft, it comes from uh, ships, uh, it comes from power plants, emission from power plants, it comes from vehicles. So the ocean will absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. And the CO2 which is absorbed will break down to form carbonic acid and hydrogen ions. Yeah, And this um, hydrogen ions will bond with uh, carbon, uh, carbonate ions to form bicarbonate. Okay, And this... Um, uh, this uh, carbonate ions, this uh, is re actually re required by marine life to build and maintain the calcium-based structure such as shells and coral. But now, instead of uh, carbonate ions, it become a bicarbonate. So this will cause the, the seawater to become unhealthy. And as a result of that, the, it will affect the coral as well. Yeah. Um, an acidic ocean ecosystem has a lower concentration of carbonate ions, limiting the ability of marine life to create calcium-based structure. So basically, uh, if we have uh, mollusks, if we have uh, coral, it is actually uh, calcium-based. Yeah. So if there is no calcium, then there is no coral. So it is uh, as, as, as simple as that. So hence, uh, ocean acidification greatly affect the, the sea creatures because it affects um, the coral and it affects the, uh, the mollusks as well. Uh, creatures that have shells, yeah? So the seawater, the pH is, is around 8 point something. Okay. Uh, this is the, in the late 1800s. Okay. And by 21, the year 2100, it is projected that the pH will be reduced from 8 something to 7 point something. And this is not good for the ocean. Okay. Um, so these are the same slides, yeah? And if the pH is low, then the shelf will dissolve in uh, acidified uh, ocean water. So there, there will be less uh, sea creature that contain shell and the coral will also, some of the coral will also be, be dissolved in acidified uh, ocean water. Uh, this is what happened yeah? when the coral is dead uh, due to uh, acidification of the seawater. Uh, this is the dead coral as well. 14.4. Um, uh, regulate harvesting and overfishing 
illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing and uh, destructive fishing practices. Okay. Uh, these are some of the uh, um, fishing techniques which actually damage the sea creatures. Uh, number one is called cyanide fishing. So cyanide is a very toxic uh, chemical and this cyanide is sprayed, yeah, sodium cyanide is sprayed into the fish habitat to stun the fish. Um, and it's mainly to catch the fish for aquariums. Uh, this is uh, cyanide fishing. Uh, this is the picture of how it is being done. And um, you can see the, the diver here, he is spraying the uh, cyanide yeah, just to stun the fish. So once the fish is stunned, it cannot run away. And this is when they use the net to catch the fish. Uh, mainly for for aquariums, yeah, a small fish like clownfish. The second one is fish bombing. In certain parts of the world, uh, the fishermen use a fish bomb. Okay, so they just throw the bomb into the sea, and once it's explode, uh, it stuns the fish as well. So this is a, where it is become very easy for them just to use a casting net and, and uh, catch the fish. Uh, this is how it is done. Yeah? So the bomb is put into this anti-light bulb and it's just throw away, throw into the sea. Uh, once it's explode, all the fish came to the surface and you just use a net to, to catch the fish. But what happened is that it damaged the coral uh, below the sea. Okay, this is again another picture how fish bomb is carried out. Uh, this is an area where a fish bomb is thrown. This is after the fish bomb is thrown. So you can see damage being done to, to the corals. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really sad to see this. Okay, overfishing is also due to uh, bottom trawling. Uh, this practice is, is, is not allowed in some countries, but uh, still some fishermen, they practice this. So in bottom trawling, they use these huge nets. It is released and it will go down all the way to the bottom of the sea and it will scoop anything that is along its way. It doesn't matter whether it is coral, small fish, big fish, turtles, whatever. It will just scoop away. And they use uh, a motor to pull the net onto, onto the ships. So this is the, the after effect of uh, bottom trawling. And again, some of the net as what you can see here, it is just left. You know, some of the net is probably broken because of the coral and it's just left uh, down at the bottom of the sea and it can become a ghost net. Yeah, so this is a, a, a better view of uh, bottom trawl fishing. So it just scoop away whatever is it's along its way. Uh, this is how, how it looks like. Uh, this is the picture before, before trawling. You can see uh, quite a number of fish, you know, some creatures, some other creatures, some uh, sea plants. This is after, uh, after trawling. You can see the, the big difference. Here we can see coral. So, so uh, being trapped in, in the net. And these fishermen, they just, you know, just throw this back to the sea. And this is a coral. And this is the small fish. And some of these fish are baby fish that do not have the opportunity to grow big yeah? because it become a bycatch. To catch the big fish, the small fish is also caught by this type of uh, fishing. Uh, another technique is called Moro Ami. Yeah, so this is the use of uh, large nets and they use uh, pounding devices. And these uh, pounding devices, uh, sometimes it is stone or large uh, cement block. Um, 
and they use this to pound the reef to scare the fish. So once the fish is scared, it come out of the coral and this is when they catch the fish. So this practice is called Muro Ami. And uh, it is performed in certain parts of the world. Yeah? Uh, in, in, in Mindanao, in Palawan, and uh, based on these slides in Indonesia and in, in Somalia as well. Okay. Uh, Muro Ami is also known as uh, reef hunting. Yeah? It destroyed the coral reef and uh, exploit uh, uh, because in some country it used children to catch the fish. And uh, SDG 14.5 conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. Okay. Uh, this is SDG number five, 10% of coastal and marine areas. So uh, this includes uh, especially mangrove and the corals. So this, this, this too is, is, is very important to be preserved. So in this picture, we can see uh, the roots of the mangrove tree. This is where it gives protection to the fish, uh, to crabs when it comes uh, around the area to breed. Yeah. And we can see quite a number of coral nearby as well. So again, the, the coral, the mangrove, it depends on each other, uh, without which the ecosystem can collapse. So the, uh, around the coastal area, we have seagrass, we have coral reef and uh, mangrove as well. So these are resources, yeah, it provide, uh, okay, provide food, provide income, building material. Uh, this is when the mangrove, it is being exploited. Yeah. Okay, uh, the local factors, water quality, overfishing, physical destruction of the uh, mangrove forests, uh, global factors, ocean warming, acidification, sea level rise, and uh, storm intensity. Uh, picture here, we can see the destruction of coral reef, dynamite fishing, and uh, damaged mangrove areas. Okay, 14.6, uh, SDG 14.6, uh, prohibit certain form of fisheries uh, subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. Eliminate subsidies that contribute to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So some countries, um, because of this uh, political situation, the government has to give uh, some subsidies to the fishermen. So when they have this uh, extra money, they mean the fishermen are buying bigger boats, they are buying uh, bigger nets, so on and so forth. And this sometimes, it, cause overfishing. You know, they are catching more than what they need. So SDG 14.6 is actually uh, advocating for eliminating of the subsidies that contribute to these uh, unregulated fishings. Uh, as you can see here, the, the flag of the country is red. So uh, I guess uh, you can kind of uh, guess what from which country that these fishing boats come from. So just imagine, you know, and this is the uh, coast guards of uh, uh, one country. And some, and I, I would say in this particular case, perhaps all the boat, they are fishing illegally in waters of some country. Yeah, so illegal fishing. Uh, for instance, uh, it was in the news, uh, Many, many times, there are some fishermen from Vietnam, from China, they uh, enter uh, Malaysian waters to catch fish, and it's illegal fishing. And we have our uh, coastal uh, coast guards that will catch them and uh, uh, charge them in court. Yeah, and most of the time, the the boat is is destroyed. 
uh, yeah, this is one of the, the fishing boats. Uh, this is Malaysia actually. Yeah? This is our Coast Guard, uh, Coast Guard boats. Uh, this is one of the illegal fishing boats uh, from some countries. So normally the Coast, Guard, uh, the Coast Guard, they will know because the design of the fishing trawler uh, is different from one country to the next. You know, the, the fishing trawler from Malaysia is a bit different from Indonesia, which is a bit different from Vietnam. So even if they use a Malaysian flag, but the design of the trawler is, is, is different. So normally uh, the Coast Guard would know that this particular uh, fishing trawler is not from Malaysia. Because sometimes they, they use uh, Malaysian flags, but originally they are not. Okay, uh, illegal fishing. Uh, you know that shark fin fetch a, quite a high price in, in China, for instance. So some of these fishing boats, they catch the shark just to get the fin. And they will, once they cut the, the fin, they will throw the shark back into the sea and the shark will die. Okay, so this is the picture of this uh, illegal fishing boat, which basically is uh, um, exploded yeah, or destroyed. And some are really big. It's, it's not a boat, it's, it's like a, uh, ships. And this, these are the, uh, some of the pictures taken, I think by Greenpeace, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, yeah, um, called a Sea Shepherd. Yeah? Uh, Greenpeace, they have one ship called a Sea, sea Shepherd and they follow certain uh, fishing, fishing ships. And these fishing, particular fishing ships actually catch shark just to get the fin. So these are the fin that has value. The dorsal fin, the pectoral fin, the uh, pelvic, the anal fin, and the uh, uh, what you call this caudal fin. So these are the fin that is being cut, and then after that, the shark is thrown back into the sea. Yeah. So you can see that the the, the shark is, is still alive when they cut the fin. So it's a very cruel practice actually. And this is the the shark left to die. You know, once they because the shark shark meat has very or no no value. It doesn't taste that good. So it's just thrown away uh, because the fin is worth more than the whole shark. And you can see, this is where they dry the shark fin and it is being sold at the uh, high-end restaurants. So you can see how many sharks that die. So these are big sharks. Yeah? You can see the fin, these are big fins. So how many sharks actually die uh, from this practice? This is even more sad. Uh, this is a smaller sharks, but nonetheless, smaller sharks will grow into big sharks. Uh, by 2030, this is uh, SDG 14.7, which is the last one. Uh, increase economic benefits of small islands, yeah? develop uh, small island developing states, uh, and least developed countries from the sustainable use of marine resources. Okay, so there are. Um, Island nation, yeah, small island nations uh, all over the world. For instance, uh, Maldives is one of those. And uh, in the case of Maldives, the highest point is just four meter from the sea level. So any increase in sea level will definitely affect the life of those uh, people who live in the islands. And uh, climate change, the rise of the sea levels, uh, the unpredicted weather. So all of this affect people who live in these small islands. Uh, this is uh, Maldives, if I'm not mistaken, the island resort of Maldives. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, one of the biggest revenue for Maldives is tourism. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Sipadan, if I'm not mistaken, in Malaysia. Um, so the Malaysian government has come up with a law that prohibit anyone from uh, staying in the uh, island of Sipadan. So only one resort is allowed. And I think one day only 30 divers are allowed to dive around the area. Yeah, And uh, tourists cannot stay overnight at the resort. It's only for day trip. So you go in the morning, you dive, have your lunch, and then in the evening, you come back. You, you go back to another island. OK. And again, because of the uh, climate change, so uh, we can see that it affects those people who live uh, in this area. We can see mangrove. 
but again, this is not a healthy mangrove uh, forest. And I believe that uh, at certain times of the year, the water level actually goes up. And given X number of years, uh, the whole area perhaps will be underwater once the sea level keep on rising. Um, this is again based on, on a mathematical model, yeah? Predictic, predicted sea level rise. Um, by 2030, which is nine years from now, uh, the sea level will rise by 0 0.2 meters or uh, 200 uh, mm or 20 centimeters. By 2050, 0 0.3. And by 2100, it will increase by almost one meter. Yeah. So what are the local impacts of sea level rise? It will cause storms, flooding, uh, saltwater intrusions, uh, changing coastlines, tides, yeah? uh, loss of property, loss of lands. So these are, uh, are the uh, effects of uh, rise of the sea levels. Okay, here uh, we can see that you know, in, in some of these places uh, used to be uh, houses where people stay and now it is submerged uh, underwater. So this, this lady, we can see her house uh, is partially underwater. And here uh, without this uh, looks like a certain a stone wall, yeah, without the stone wall, uh, there is no island, yeah. Uh, this is the flooding because of the water level from the sea, sea water. Uh, inundation and displacement of wetlands, yeah, the mangrove, uh, salt marsh, uh, intertidal areas. So, all of this uh, is due to the increase of the uh, sea level. I don't think I have that much, that many more slides to show. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. So what can be done? This is the last section of my uh, sharing. So in, in, in many parts of the world now, there are plenty of efforts being put to actually uh, replant the coral. Yeah, so there are many uh, uh, many organizations that is actually uh, doing this 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 kind of work, and there are also uh, many universities that are doing a lot of research in how to best regrow areas in which the coral is already dead. Uh, again, to replant the uh, mangrove tree. Um, oops. So here, uh, yeah. So we can see here in in 2013 the beach is 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 uh, eroded, and what is being done here? A uh, wall is being built. Yeah. So once the 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 wall is built, so the 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 island they got their beach back. So this is again why it is it is quite important to study the the pattern of the wave. Perhaps if we can have something like a, a wave breaker, so we can probably save certain parts of the uh, of the beach. Um, okay, a hard engineering is is again the the build of seawall uh, and uh, gabion, uh, what is called a rip wrap and uh, grayon. So this is uh, called a hard engineering to protect the, the beach. Yeah, a soft engineering approach, uh, cliff regrading, uh, manage the retreat uh, using of a uh, geotextiles, uh, having a drainage pipes, uh, beach nourishment. Uh, this is in in the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so this is again the use of hard engineering to control the flow of the seawater. Uh, this is uh, in the Netherlands as well. The, the, you can see the dike. And again, you can see uh, these uh, structures here, uh, again, to, to prevent the uh, erosion of the dike. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess that will be all for my sharing today. 
and uh, I pass back to uh, Mr. Raditya Danu. Yep, uh, thank you, Professor Rahman. Uh, it is very interesting uh, uh, materials. We have set. 17 SDGs, and we have discussed the 40th SDG, the topic of life below water, and what are the causes of the pollution and their sources. It is very concerning seeing how much problems that we have, and we really screwed, we really polluted the ocean, and it's our responsibility. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and uh, from the Google uh, form, we have two questions. The first one is from Tanya. It is from ITS. Uh, the the question is: uh, Do you think uh, do you think it's you is referred to uh, Professor Rahman? Uh, do you think ocean will be free from plastics, or it will, or it will be worse in ten years from now? This is the question from Tanya from Architecture Department of Institute of Technology, Professor Rahman. Okay. Um... Will ocean be free from plastics? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, no, if nothing is being done, then there'll be more plastic dumped into the sea. But we can do something actually. Uh, number one is education. This is the most important one. Uh, even small kids, even at a primary school, they should be taught uh, the effect of plastics to the environment. So by having this awareness at the early stage, it becomes part of their way of life, you know? And perhaps um, um, they, by, by having this knowledge in them, when they grow up, you know, uh, they will start using less plastic or even if they use plastics, they will not just throw it away. This is number one, through education, yeah? The second one is, through regulations. Uh, in some countries in the world, uh, I'm not quite sure which, which country, you know, um, um, certain plastic is, is, okay, I think in, in Europe, if I'm not mistaken, in Europe, uh, usually when we buy electronic products, it is wrapped in this uh, polystyrene. Yeah, it has this polystyrene padding, the one that is white in color, right? And if I'm not mistaken, any product that is to be shipped in Europe, it cannot have this uh, polystyrene anymore. This is by law. So what manufacturers has done is that they use this uh, paper, uh, what's called uh, paper pulp, yeah, from recycled paper for packaging purposes. This is by law. Yeah. So by, by having this kind of regulation, so there is less and less polystyrene that is being used for packaging. But this is only for Europe. But for some other countries that does not have this kind of law, it is still being used you know, uh, up until today. So the, the government has, has a role to play. But the public has also a role in, in, in a way that the public must put some pressure on the government or the regulators to come up with this kind of regulations. And in Europe, I think the environmental movement is very strong. Uh, in fact, in European Parliament, they have what they call a Green Party that is pushing uh, all of these uh, uh, ideas uh, into, into the Parliament so that it become a law. Yeah, so uh, the answer to that, uh, again, is yes and no. If nothing is being done, yeah, the ocean will not be free from this plastic pollution. But I think the, the most important thing is the awareness. Yeah, we can have as, as many laws as we want, but there is if there is no one to, to, to monitor, to enforce the law, you know, people still uh, practice what, what, what they are doing. But awareness is extremely, extremely important. Yep. Yep, thank you, Professor Rahman, for the answer. Uh, 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 for, for, Mrs., for Ms. Tanya, if you have uh, any more question or you have uh, feedback to Professor Rahman, you can uh, freely talk uh, uh, using your, your uh, speakers. So, uh, Mr. Tanya, if uh, you're still there, uh, you can uh, talk. Or if not, I will continue to the next question. It is from uh, Fadol from Department of Ocean Engineering, uh, ITS Surabaya. 
uh, it's quite a long question, so I will read it uh, to you. Uh, this is an intriguing question, Professor Rahman. As we know, Malaysia and Indonesia is categorized as developing country, which are striving to be a developed country. As we develop a lot of infrastructures, industrial and a lot of revenue generator that mainly causes pollution. Just like the westernest country do in their industrial revolution, uh, Japan and Korea in their uh, miracle of a river in 50s and 60s, Chinese economic boom from 90s and still ongoing. All of them paid less care to the environment. Now, the UN suddenly forced all the countries, including us, to do, do, to do green this and green that by pushing all, by reducing the carbon emission, and so on. Is that fair for us? Do we have the same right to pollute the, pollute the ocean for the sake of economic growth? Where is the justice? So this is a very intriguing question, indeed. Oh, it's a very tough question to answer. <laughs> I'll, try my, <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, okay. Um, of course, uh, any country in the world, they want to be uh, uh, developed countries you know, to increase the standard of living, the population, so on and so forth. Uh, but I think for me, the most important thing, we must have some kind of balance uh, between development and preserving the environment. And for Malaysia and Indonesia, because we are unique as compared to other countries, uh, this is where perhaps uh, we, we need to have our own model, you know, uh, to, to balance uh, between the economic development and the environment. And we, we can see that some of, of uh, the countries in the West, for instance, they are quite successful in this. So some of these things, that we, these are the things that we can copy from them. For instance, public transport. So in the West, in Germany, in, in Belgium, in the UK, in Japan, in Korea, uh, not many people actually own cars. They use, they heavily, especially those in big cities in Tokyo, I have been to Tokyo a couple of times, even top professors at the universities, they use public transport. Yeah? So uh, this, this is something that we can copy from them. So future town planners, future city planners, they have to incorporate this public transport in their planning. Uh, but what happened now, uh, in some countries, the city planners, when they plan, they plan for car, it's called car centric. So if I have a town, where should be the road? Where should be the bus stop? You know, uh, not bus stop, where should be the road? Where should be the highway? Where should be the parking lots? So they have this in their mind. They design for vehicles. But in the West, it's a bit different. When they design the city, when the city planner design, what they think about is, okay, no car, number one, a lot of public spaces, and bicycle lanes. So it's already being planned. But in some country, uh, we have a road. We have people who want to cycle. Okay, what do we do? Oh, yeah, we, we just draw uh, or we paint a line, a yellow line. Yeah, okay, this is your cycling lane. And this is just next to the car lane. So uh, we, we, we uh, in some country, it is an afterthought. Yeah. So in this particular case, uh, as again, as I said just now, the city planners, uh, they have to play a role. When you design something, you have to be uh, not car centric. Yeah. Uh, everything has to be close so that it is within a walking distance. So you have one residential here and the cleaning and the schools is like 10 kilometers away. So there is no way people will walk. So people will ride their motorbikes, you know. The, so this is in terms of planning. But from what I can see in Japan, uh, it is really planned. Uh, for instance, uh, the train station, the moment you walk out of the train station, they have a grocery store, they have restaurants, uh, and then uh, there is a bus station. So if you go to Japan in terms of connectivity, it is seamless. Yeah? The public transport is seamless. From, one tra uh, from the train station, you have bus, and then the bus station will go to another train station, and then you have taxis. You, know, you have a lot of alternative. And usually in Japan, 
uh, all the train station, they have uh, an area where people can actually park their bicycles, uh, not just in Japan, but in, uh, in other countries as well. For instance, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, yeah? a lot of people ride bicycles in the Netherlands. When I visited uh, uh, Belgium, it's also the same. A lot of people ride uh, bicycles. Even those who are wearing suit and ties, they ride bicycles. Probably number one because of the weather is nice. But again, this, this is, uh, even if the weather is hot, like Malaysia and, and uh, Indonesia, it is the will of the people. Uh, one time I was in, in Bradford in the United Kingdom. So I met these a few guys, uh, lecturers as well, and some are researchers. So I was talking to them about bicycles. And Bradford is quite a hilly area. So this guy, he told me that he cycled from his house to the university, it's, like, it's 10 miles. Yeah? They don't use kilometer in the UK, they use miles. So 10 miles is like 16, 16 kilometer one way. So I, I asked him during um, spring and, and uh, during the cold season, it's quite okay for you to, to ride bicycles because you don't sweat. What if during the summer? So he, he told me that during summer, he still ride, to, still ride his bicycles to the university, but for the staff at the university, they are uh, provided with uh, a shower rooms, a changing room, and a place where they can actually park their bike. So if I, I, I ride bicycles, I park my bicycles, I go to ch the changing room, I take a shower, and then I will wear my suit, and then I will go to work. Yeah, so when I want to go back home, I just reverse the process, you know, just take off my shoes, put on my uh, riding attire, my helmet, and just I ride back to, to, to my home. And another one uh, in England, in, in, in London, from the city of London to Cambridge, next to the highway, there is a bicycle lane. So you can actually cycle from London to Cambridge. And it is not on the same road, yeah? it's a separate bicycle lane. So this is, this is in terms of uh, Planning. So these are the things that we can copy from, uh, from Western countries. And the other one in terms of uh, forests, we have to preserve our forests. Uh, Indonesia, just like Malaysia, uh, a certain number of our export is actually hardwood yeah, uh, to other countries. So this hardwood, it will take hundreds of years to grow and by cutting the wood, you know, it affects the, the, the whole uh, ecosystems. So in terms of economy, we cannot depend that much more on, on logging. So we have to look for other alternatives. So uh, this, is, this is just my, my personal view. And the other one is in terms of development. Uh, in many parts, we as Asian, yeah, we, we like to live on the ground. You know, if you if you if if you want to buy a house, you want some small land where you want to plant something, right? Uh, this is very common among Asian. This is the dream of everyone. But the higher the the more population that we have, that means we need more lands to build houses. Okay, and land is very limited. So in some country, agricultural land is converted to become a residential area. In some other countries, they just cut the trees. You know and convert that into a residential area. Um, but this is not sustainable. Uh, what I, I, I would foresee, uh, for instance, in Singapore. Yeah? So in Singapore, landed property is very expensive. It's not meant for everyone. Public housing it means you go up high rise. So by going high rise, you use less land. So I can see this in Singapore, in Taiwan, uh, Japan, they cannot do that because of the earthquake. Yeah? But Singapore and Taiwan, they are actually going upwards. So the land use in Singapore and Taiwan still remain as it is. So the new residential area is always high-rise building. Uh, this is more sustainable compared to having everything on the ground. Okay. okay. I, I hope I, I yeah. answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very tough uh, question. In the, uh, uh, Sorry, I forgot the, the, the question. Uh, um, Muhammad Padol, if you want to add something or you want to, to uh, uh, answer, or you want to feedback, uh, the, the answer from Professor Rahman, you are very much welcome. So if not, I will uh, 
uh, uh, step to the next uh, question. It is uh, Ika Octavia Nawati from uh, Department of Chemistry, uh, ITS Surabaya. Uh, I read uh, the question uh, for you, Professor Rahman. Thanks for the interesting talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Rahim. I just want to add one factor that influenced the health, the health of the sea creatures. There is the less presence of heavy metal compounds. What do you think? And I see your picture before about the bombing of the illegal fishing boat. My pride to say as well that our previous, marine, uh, our previous ministry of marine uh, and fisheries was brave enough to explode every single illegal fishing boat Entering, entering our sea that it was our, our, our minister, but now it's not anymore. So yeah, the, the question is, uh, what do you think about the less presence of heavy metal compound on the uh, sea creatures out? And the comments on the explosion of illegal fishing boots, yeah. Okay. Um, right, um, okay, I did not touch on heavy metal um, in chemistry or chemical engineering, I think you know one uh, case study, uh, one, one uh, scholar, it happens in Japan in the 1960s, uh, one chemical plant called Chiso, yeah, Chiso uh, chemical, it released methyl mercury into uh, Minamata Bay in Japan. You know, if, if you Google, you type Minamata disease, then you can read the whole article of methyl mercury. So this methyl mercury, back then in the 1960s, even in Japan, they don't know the long-term effect of methyl mercury. So methyl mercury is released into Minamata Bay. And Minamata Bay is where the fishermen fish so the metal mercury, because it is quite heavy, it settled down into the bottom and it lays the plankton. So uh, all the plankton on the seabed is laced with metal mercury. So when the fish eat the plankton, it eats the metal mercury as well. Okay, and people eat the fish. No effect, nothing whatsoever. Yeah, but what metal mercury do? Metal mercury will go inside the body it will be absorbed by the blood and it causes genetic damage to the children. Yeah. So if you search again, uh, Minamata disease, you can see a lot of uh, pictures of these uh, children who have these birth defects due to the fact of this uh, heavy metal, which is methyl mercury being released into the ocean. Yeah. So I think uh, in many countries in the world now, there is a very strong regulation against the release of um, uh, heavy metals uh, like methyl mercury, chromium, uh, etc. Uh, into, into the water. Okay. But again, that is a very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, heavy metal, especially from industrial waste. The second one is the blow up of ships um, or fishing vessels. Uh, I think this is a very good practice because the price of fishing vessel is very, very expensive. Uh, one big fishing vessels can be like 500,000 ringgit or almost 200,000 US dollars. This is not cheap. So the practice in some country, so you catch this illegal fishermen. Okay. Uh, these are basically very poor people and they work for some rich guy who owned the fishing boat. Okay. Uh, but you don't catch the owner. You catch this uh, crew. Okay. You sentence them to jail. And in some country, okay, the boat is open for auction. Uh, that means if I have money, so once a year, the fishery department, uh, they will open up the auction. Okay. So this boat, okay, starting price, 50,000 US dollars. So people will bid for that and the very same owner will come and bid for the boat and he will get his boat back in one year. <laughs> so if you, you blow up the boat, it will be a big loss for, for the owner. And I think that is a very good practice because it becomes a deterrent. You know? 
So instead of making uh, so many thousand, I lost 500,000 on my boat. So I don't want to, to do that anymore because these people, they are serious, you know, they mean business. Uh, but if, if we just take the boat, you know, we confiscate the boat and then after that we open for bidding and whatnot, no, this will not solve the problem. And blowing out the boat, I think this is a very good practice. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, apparently uh, it is not uh, this this good practice. Uh, apparently, not continued, not not not, not inherited uh, by the new ministers, uh, by, 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 by the new minister of fisheries. Yeah, so it's very uh, uh, like. So uh, the next question uh, is from sorry, uh, I lost it. Okay, it is from uh, Gina. Uh, it is I, 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 he, she she did not uh, 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 told the department, but it is from uh, ATS Surabaya. So this is again a very uh, uh, interesting question. I, I read it for you, Professor. Our current uh, world order favors a rich minority. I feel that. To achieve the sustainable development means that we need a serious reformation of our system, uh, transportation system, the energy use, uh, uh, trading rules, and uh, for the powerful people to give up some of their power. But will they want to give it up? For example, the palm oil businesses, fishery businesses, oil and gas, and also many. Can we force them to do so? So, uh, yeah, we have. We have uh, talked about it a little uh, from the previous question. So uh, do you have any more comment on this question, uh, Professor Rahman? Okay. Um, I think in terms of greenhouse gases or C, um, uh, the release of CO2 in the environment, it become a big concern for many countries. If I'm not mistaken, yeah? uh, by 2035, the government of the United Kingdom will not allow any more fossil fuel car on the road. Everything has to be electric vehicle or EV. So that is in terms of regulation, hoping that by 2035, um, there will be less CO2 release in the atmosphere. Okay. And we can see the trend now. Um, Tesla, yeah. Um, out of nowhere, in, in about 10 years or so, it become very big because the production of electric uh, vehicle, all Tesla vehicles are EV. And uh, China is also going big on EV. Uh, in fact, there is one company from China called Geely. They produce a new uh, model of uh, EV, electric vehicle, which they claim is better than Tesla. We have yet to see that model, but that is what they claim. Another company from China called BYD uh, is also doing business in Europe because they are able to develop this public transport, mainly bus, which use EV. And uh, it is a very, what you say this, uh, fuel efficient uh, in terms of uh, consumption of electric uh, from the batteries. So this is, this, this is uh, okay, this is one. And the other one in terms of uh, energy, um, if there is demand, less demand for fossil fuel, that means there is less incentive for companies to invest in oil and gas development. Yeah, so it becomes a disincentive for them. And we can see some, that some of these uh, oil and gas companies, they are diversifying. So instead of oil and gas, they are going into solar. Companies like ExxonMobil, companies, uh, there are few companies in the Scandinavian country that are investing now uh, not just in solar, but in wind farm as well. Yeah, because in the North Sea, uh, the wind is very strong. And this, this wind farm is built not close to the shore, but sometimes like 20, 30, 40 kilometers from the shore. And they are using the offshore technology. You know, previously offshore technology is just building the platform to extract the oil. But now they're using the same technology to construct this uh, windmill way into the sea. And um, people are doing, also doing a lot of research on using this wave or undercurrent to run the uh, turbine to generate electricity. If I'm not mistaken, in one island in the Philippines, 
uh, to power the the inhabitants of the island as well as this uh, uh, lighthouse. Uh, it makes use of uh, water turbine under undercurrent. Un uh, sorry, uh, underwater turbine that use uh, underwater current. Yeah, uh, to generate electricity. So th this this kind of thing is is sustainable, and if the government give incentive or they come up with regulations that discourage company uh, from polluting and going into green, uh, I believe more company will will jump on the bandwagon, and of course they will have a public support as well. And I think in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if you live in one area, okay, uh, so the, the population in that particular area, they, they form a cooperative. So this cooperative will build uh, one windmill. Okay, so the electricity that is generated from this windmill goes back to the people who live around the area. So basically, you, you invest once, uh, then you don't have to pay your electricity bill anymore. So something like that, no? they have this, this kind of, of scheme uh, in certain parts of, of Europe. Uh, again, to depend less and less on fossil fuel. Uh, for instance, eh, uh, in terms of pollution, uh, what is called a PM 2.5, particulate matter, uh, less than 2.5 microns. So if we inhale this uh, PM 2.5, it will go deep down into our alveoli and it, will, can, it can cause a lot of diseases. Yeah, so this is the result of emission that are coming from mainly from power plants. So uh, there are many countries now that is um, uh, they have they have law to uh, for power plant you know to phase out the coal fired power plant. But again, countries like China and India uh, they are still using this coal fired power plant because the source of fuel is quite cheap. Uh, in order to electrify the, the country. But in, in, in developing countries, mainly they are going for, for the green energy, which is much more sustainable, uh, partly to reduce the amount of uh, CO2 release into the atmosphere. Okay. That, that would be my response. Yep. Yep. Thank you, uh, Professor Raman. So this is the, 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 the end of the question from the Google form. So I will look. Uh, at the chat box, so we have one uh, uh, response from Stefan Kenter from uh, Netherlands. Uh, he said that we do not ride bicycles due to the nice weather only. Uh, we, uh, it is more because of the safe infrastructure for the bicycles. Also because it is in our roots, we learn to ride bicycles from a young age. So this is uh, also an important aspect the, the infrastructure for the bicycle uh, uh, riders that we found it uh, in, in Malaysia in, 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 and also in Indonesia, I believe it is not fully developed yet. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, because to ride a bicycle in Malaysia is not safe at all. It is totally unsafe. Uh, number one, we don't have the infrastructure for that. We don't have a separate lane for bicycles. It is just next to the car lane. Uh, you know, you have you have cars, you have trucks, you have buses. Totally unsafe. It's so number one. Uh, the second one is uh, our drivers. They are not tolerant to those who ride bicycles. Uh, this is again in terms of education. But in the West, it's a bit different. If someone saw a bicyclist want to cross the road, they will just stop the car. Okay, you you go first. Here is the reverse. You see a bicyclist. You increase your speed <laughs> so that you don't want them to cross the road and <laughs> and slow your your journey so this this kind of of, of uh, awareness is not yet that yeah and i think the uh, the other one uh, uh this is just my personal belief i think people in in the netherlands perhaps they are more health conscious probably because when you cycle you know you become very healthy uh, i noticed this uh, when i was in 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 belgium in gen uh, to be honest with you, um, most of the Belgian they ride bicycles, and in certain cities, cars are totally banned. You know, you cannot drive car into the city center; it's totally banned. Uh, either you walk or you uh, ride a bicycles. And from my own observation, 
it is seldom to see someone who is overweight in Belgium because almost everyone cycles. And interestingly, the place that I stay called Ghent, it is quite a hilly area. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> you are struggling to, to ride bicycles and, and, and indirectly you burn more calories. So you become more healthy and you become more slim and lanky, you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's 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 uh, the thing that 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 uh, we have to improve a lot, both from Indonesia and Malaysia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, uh, finished the the question from the Google form and the chat box. If anyone want to add some uh, question or comments from the floor, uh, directly speak to us. You can also speak in Bahasa, if you yeah. want. Yeah, uh, if anyone want to add comment. If not, so uh, I, as a concluding remarks, uh, Professor Rahman, it is my personal question to you. Uh, uh, this is my, 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 what is it? my uh, personal uh, question. Uh, as an engineer that, uh, you know, that we are uh, convicted with the doctrine to create a lightest, cheapest, yet most profitable products, all of type of engineers today. But, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but, but mostly uh, the, 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 the premise is that uh, to create a lightest, cheapest, yet most profitable products. Uh, that mainly uh, uh, cause most uh, uh, pollution that, that, that that premise from me personally uh, uh, create most pollution that, 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 that mainly most responsible for the pollution. For the future, for the next generation engineers, from your perfect perspective, what can we do? Um, okay. I think things, things will definitely change. Um, to come up with something which is uh, uh, cheap, um, cheap does not necessarily means that it is. Uh, okay, what shall I say? This. Um, okay. So normally, when engineers design, we have what we call this uh, user requirements. Yeah, we have the user requirements. That is number one. From the user requirements, we come up with the uh, what we call these technical specifications. Mm -hmm. And then we develop the concept design, a few concept designs perhaps, then we develop, and then we do a, what we call this concept design selection or design selection, and then we come up with a prototype, a material selection, so on and so forth. Okay, so here is the user requirements. If the user requires something that is probably, say for instance, use less fuel, for instance, yeah? Uh, that is a requirement by the user. So the engineer has to comply to that. Another example is this. You know, in the airline industry, 25% of the operation cost, 25% is actually spent on fuel. So if you can save 1%, that is a lot of money. Okay. So there is uh, this indirect pressure from airlines to airline manufacturer, companies like Boeing, companies like Airbus, to develop or to come up or to design aircraft which use less fuel. So the engineer has to crack their head, quote unquote, you know, on how to save fuel for this aircraft. And compared uh, Boeing and, and, and Airbus, I think Boeing do a better job as compared to Airbus because uh, Boeing developed the uh, Boeing 787. So the Boeing 787, it used, uh, quite a high percentage, it, it makes use of composite material. The conventional aircraft, the skin of the aircraft is actually made from aluminum alloy. So if you were to compare aluminum alloy with uh, carbon fiber, uh, the weight to strength ratio, carbon fiber is much higher. That is why all the expensive vehicles Uh, automobiles or uh, whatever models, yeah, it makes use of um, carbon fiber. Even Formula One use uh, carbon fiber. 
because of the high strength to weight ratio. And Boeing actually used the same material to build its uh, aircraft. So the fuselage, uh, certain parts of the wing, the vertical stabilizer, it makes use of um, carbon composite material because it is lightweight. It's able to reduce the use of fuel and it benefits the airline because it's, it lower their operating cost. So instead of 25% that they spend on fuel, probably now is 23%. I don't know. But that is the benefit that the airline get. So here it comes from the customer requirements. So for developed countries, the customer actually requests for a green product, for instance. If you design something which is not green, we are not going to buy. And in some countries, customers are willing to pay a higher price for green products. Uh, I have, okay, uh, I've been to, to, to Switzerland. So if you go to, the, to Switzerland, if you go to the grocery shops, you want to buy lemon, for instance. So lemons, it has a, you know, it comes from different countries. You know, this one is from Spain. This one is from Israel. This one is uh, from other countries. Or if you want to buy a capsicum or whatever vegetables, okay? Okay, the one from Spain is probably cheaper than the one that is, which is grown locally. But to some people, if I were to buy something from Spain, you know, this thing has to travel from Madrid all the way to uh, Zurich, Switzerland, so many thousand miles that you can see the carbon footprint, you know, uh, from one country crossing to another country, crossing to another country. So the amount of carbon released to the atmosphere from the transportation or logistics is very high, but it is cheap, but I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to buy this one, which is locally grown. Slightly expensive is okay, because I know that this one has less carbon footprint. Uh, so you see, the, this is the, 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 the level of awareness is, is a bit different. It depends on country to country. But for most of us Asian, we don't care. As long as it is cheap, we go for that one. Yeah? Uh, but, but for some people, people who are more aware of the environment, they are willing to pay slightly more. But the, what they want is something which is green. So I don't contribute to global warming. I play my parts. I have uh, this feel good uh, feelings in me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the answer, Professor uh, uh, So, uh, with that uh, question, it will conclude our webinar today. To, so, to, to, to wrap it up, so we have learned a lot of uh, going on. Uh, it's not right now. It is very concerning that we have a lot of problem below the oceans and we are really quote unquote screwed. And it is our responsibility to act. We will take a full responsibility to provide a better future for our next generation. Uh, if in if allow in Bahasa, it kalau bukan kita siapa lagi? Gitu. Yeah, <laughs> benar. Kalau bukan kita siapa lah? If not us, yeah. who else? <laughs> who else? Who else? Yep. So anyone uh, uh, wants to add, or oh, oh, Professor Rahman, you uh, want to have some concluding uh, uh, sentences, uh, uh, statements? Okay, I, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, it's, it's a very long session. Yeah, <laughs> I hope everyone benefit from my sharing. Uh, I will share my slides with uh, the international office. Uh, none of these slides are mine. I actually pick it up from the internet. Yeah? I just uh, compile everything together uh, and uh, make it into a, a presentation. And I'm not doing any serious research in uh, anything below the sea, below water. Yeah? Uh, but it is my personal interest uh, because uh, I'm in a way, and I can say the environmentalist, you know, I'm very well aware of what is uh, happening around the world. And uh, because I'm also a diver, so I have a first-hand experience of looking into dead corals, you know. Uh, so this, this, this is things that really touch my heart. And we, uh, because we don't live in this world for very long and we don't want to damage the world. So we have to play our parts as well. Uh, number one, the least we can do is that we can practice this uh, ourselves to be more environmentally conscious, uh, to use less plastic bags. Yeah, for instance, now, if I go to grocery shops, I will bring my own bags. So at least there is less plastic bags that is uh, being thrown away. Uh, and then um, I also drive a hybrid car. So 
hopefully I don't use that much uh, gasoline on the roads. Uh, so th these are the things that we can actually do. And the other one is that we can educate um, our friends, our relatives, our children in the future, you know, on this uh, environment, very important uh, environmental issues. You know? So that is the least that, that we can actually do. And the other one, now we have a lot of, uh, every one of us has social media, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, etc. So if we find something which is interesting to share with regards to the environment, so we just share in Facebook, in, in our WhatsApp group or whatever. So at least out of 1,000 of our friends, maybe one or two will read that or we share that, you know, uh, whatever things that we share, that is good enough, you know, just to give awareness to, to, to the people. Uh, for instance, recently I found one, uh, one poster. If we plant trees in the city center, it is able to reduce temperature by so many degrees. So I just copy from somewhere and put on my Facebook and I can see uh, quite a number of people respond to that. So that is good enough. Even two, three people is good enough for me. Yeah, that means people pay attention to what I put up on my Facebook. So this is the least that we can actually do. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Professor Rahman. So yeah, to, to share all the awareness is, is not only one responsibility, but all of us uh, are responsible to share the awareness, at least to share the awareness. So uh, yeah, from that, uh, I conclude today's uh, webinar and I thank you so much for all of the participants. Uh, we reached uh, maximum of, I don't know, like 50 or 60 uh, 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 participants is quite good enough. And then uh, uh, menyambung seperti tadi Pak Rahman bilang bahwa uh, we have to share, we need, we need to share. So I share our YouTube uh, uh, link today. So if you want to share the, 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 the two days discussion to your friend, you can share the, the, the YouTube link uh, on the chat box. And then I will give it back to the uh, Miss uh, MC, so the time and the stage is yours again. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Raghav Danu, for conducting this amazing session, and also thank you very much to Dr. Abdul Rahman for the excellent lecture today. So please give applause to our speaker and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. Okay, furthermore, I would like to share a certificate awarding for both our speakers and moderator today. However, since our campus is half open, we apologize as it is not yet fully signed. So the first one, we will have the certificate presented for Dr. Abdurrahman Abdurrahim uh, as our speaker today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice certificate. Thank you very much. And also the second one, we will have the certificate presented for Mr. Antia Danu as our moderator today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thank you very much. We hope to be able to send the scanned version of the certificate to students in the future. And we will also send it to your postal address. Once again, thank you very much to Dr. Abdurrahman and Mr. Radia Danu for your availability in today's guest lecture series. We believe that your lecture will be useful for all participants. It's my now, pleasure. before we end our lecture today, we invite all participants as well as the honorable speaker and moderator to take a group photo. To all participants, please open your camera. Okay, so as we only have one slide, so please keep your smile until we finish the photo session. Okay, now I will count until three. One, two, three. Okay, once again. One, two, three. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. So now we finish the group photo. Then for all the participants, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly slash feedback gls that you can also see on the Zoom chat box. 
and the deadline for filling the feedback form is one hour after we finish the session. We want to remind you the participants who will get the STEM are the participants who come on time, join this event until the end, and also fill the feedback form. Finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series and we sincerely apologize for any mistakes we may have made in presenting as Masters of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you very much to our honorable speaker, moderator, and all participants for the attention and cooperation. We will see you in the next guest lecture series on SDGs. Good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Rahman and uh, Danu, for today's session and all the participants. Me, uh, I'm re representing of the BIC of KLS. Uh, let me. Uh, we will have next KLS on SDGs. Uh, please kindly find that information on our social media. Thank you so much for the participant and all. Thank you so much.